And at number 10, Mutant X Storm. Mutant X Storm is a mutant vampire. She goes by the name Bloodstorm. Classic. After being captured by Dracula, who wanted her as one of his brides, Storm is turned into a vampire. She gets her revenge though, aiding the X Men in defeating Dracula, although she felt it was only right for her to leave the team now that she was infected with vampirism. Vampirism? Vampirism. And you know, bloodlust and what have you. Kinda would be problematic if you're trying to work on a team and you just keep trying to bite your peers. Imagine that wouldn't go over well. Later on, she would cross paths with Gambit, who pleaded with her to turn him into a vampire. So she agreed and she sired him, something that he would later resent her for in the long run. Moving on to number nine, Dark Claw. Dark Claw is the amalgamation of Batman and Wolverine from the Amalgam universe. So why is he scary and not just like totally freaking awesome? Well, just look at him. Debuting back in 1966, this character was a meta mutant detective whose origin story is a combination between the two iconic characters' own beginnings. Logan Wayne witnessed his parents' murders as a child. When he grew up, he would join the Air Force and eventually was transferred to the Weapon X program. This is where he gains his Wolverine abilities, his adamantium lace skeleton, and a supercharged increase in strength. Deemed a failure by those conducting the Weapon X program, he ended up going back home to New Gotham City and became Dark Claw, roaming the streets as a vigilante fighting crime. And at number eight, Storm Phoenix. Coming at you from What If Volume 2 Issue 79, this alternate version of Storm is a version that had the power of the Phoenix rather than Jean Grey. The Phoenix Force possesses her after a mission in space with the X-Men. When she comes back to Earth, she ends up creating a worldwide organization to protect the environment. Seems noble, right? But you know, she takes a little too far. Instead of it just being a regular altruistic organization, Storm openly harms those opposed to her ideals, suspending them in animation up in the Earth's atmosphere. Which you gotta admit is actually kind of a funny way to you know, be like, fuck you to somebody, <laughs> suspend you up in the air. She ends up freezing an entire community after they violate an anti-hunting agreement. Eventually Storm Phoenix is defeated thanks to Kitty Pride phasing into her original body. But all in all, things could have escalated to much darker territory if she hadn't been stopped when she was. Moving on to number 7, The Red Queen. This alternate version of Jean Grey hails from Earth 9575 an alternate reality that's first seen in X-Man issue 5 from 1995. This gene has been depowered thanks to previous crimes she's committed, and it's a little unclear as to whether or not she had access to the Phoenix Force in the past. Now, having been banished from her own Earth, Earth 998, she decides to reinvent herself by pretending to be a reincarnated version of Queen Madeline, Madeline Pryor, her clone. From here, she embarks on a quest to become the Queen of Britain and eventually conquer the rest of the planet. And she had a plan to do it and restore her powers by finding various different iterations of Nate Grey from across the multiverse. She would essentially lure them onto her Earth, use them, drain them of their abilities until they died, and then, you know, just grab another one and use him. Eventually, she tries this trick on the 616 Nate Grey, who ends up breaking free from her powers, which results in her draining all of the life force of the other Nate Greys in an attempt to defeat the 616 Nate. But eventually, Nate creates a sun around her and burns her alive. And fun fact, later on in the 616 continuity, Madeline Pryor would actually begin using the alias of Red Queen. Funny enough. She's like, I'm inspired. Moving on to number 6, Age of Apocalypse Colossus. Colossus of Earth 295 from the Age of Apocalypse Earth is not only frightening, but absolutely tragic. During the Age of Apocalypse event, he was forced out of retirement for a second time. The first was after he was so severely injured that he couldn't transform back into his human form, and was only kept together by Magneto's metal manipulation. The second time though that he came out of retirement was thanks to him needing to go on a very important mission to combat Apocalypse for Magneto. He and his wife Shadowcat led a team of mutants to save Colossus' sister, Ileana, who was the only mutant left alive with reality traveling powers. In the process of rescuing her, he and Shadowcat abandoned their team, leaving them for dead. When he later learned that the reality that Magneto was trying to save with her powers, and his plan, was one in which Ileana was dead, he went berserk, going on a rampage that caused the deaths of several mutants, including his own wife. He was eventually killed by Gambit as a last resort in trying to control the mutant. And at number 5, Brute from Mutant X. Beast has had a handful of scary alternate versions, but this one looks like he crawled right out of a creature feature. Here we have Hank McCoy of Earth 1298, the Mutant X Earth, who is known as Brute rather than Beast. Brute came to be thanks to a series of deadly experiments that he conducted on himself that not only changed him into this aquatic esque being, which allowed him to breathe underwater, but also reduced his intelligence down to the level of a child in kindergarten. He is later further mutated, gaining hooves for feet. While he may not have his smarts anymore, the character does have 
have a berserker streak, which, when unleashed, can be fatal for anyone in his way, especially considering his mental temperament. He's a bit of a tragic character as well. He was falsely accused of the murders of Green Goblin and Ben Riley, and was executed for it. And at number four, New Sun Gambit. From Earth 9921, we have this insanely powerful and terrifying version of Gambit known as New Sun. New Sun has control of kinetic energy on a molecular level. This means he can turn any object's potential energy into kinetic energy, which in turn makes it explosive. And it's a power without much limitations. He doesn't need to make physical contact with an object to do so, and can even do it to living beings, including humans. His total kinetic control can also stop motion, and he can simulate other kinds of energy with it, manipulating whatever kinetic energy is present in order to simulate energies like infrared energy, all by molecular agitation. In addition to that, dude can transform himself into an energy wave, which allows him to travel through space and into other dimensions. Plus, he's also killed his reality's phoenix, which is no easy feat. He dies in Gambit Volume 3, Issue 23, when he's impaled and then explodes, which also causes his world to explode in the process. Yeah. And at number three, X Men Forever Storm. The X Men Forever Storm is also known as Perfect Storm and resides on Earth 161. She's a clone of the original Storm who was created in order to restore the powers of heroes who are trapped on Genosha. But the clone became unstable, rapidly aged, and during an incident with the Shadow King, absorbed the darker, less friendly aspects of his personality, to say the least. She ended up becoming malevolent and ambushed the X Men team during a mission. She would then kill Wolverine and betray the team entirely, fleeing to Wakanda to seek out T'Challa's protection. T'Challa, who had previously been in a relationship with the regular Storm, believed that she was good and saw that she was making an effort to help the people of Wakanda, changing the weather, helping the innocent, you name it. But eventually, after the two got married, Storm betrayed him too, letting Killmonger into their quarters, who killed the rest of the royal family and T'Challa. Also, she could rule Wakanda. Moving on to number two, the Age of X Cyclops. This Cyclops hails from Earth 11326, an Earth in which anti mutant propaganda is on the rise. And anti mutant protests eventually lead to the decimation of mutants by the US government. As you can imagine, Cyclops did not fare well in this socio political climate. Scott operated under the name Basilisk, and after being captured by the government, his eyelids were removed in order to prevent him from having any sort of control over his optic blasts. He was then forced to wear a mask by the prison he was kept in. And was used by Alcatraz as a mutant executioner. Kind of dark. He eventually managed to escape and managed to save some of the other mutants in the process too, but he's forever haunted by the guilt of what he was forced to do and the lives of innocent mutants that he ended. And finally, in at number one, The Ruins Charles Xavier. I feel like anytime Professor X has an alternate that's evil, that particular Earth suffers big time because of it. This version of Charles Xavier comes from 1995's Ruins, one of the most depressing and dark alternate reality stories in the Marvel multiverse. Taking place Place on Earth 9591, this Charles was elected president of the US rather than creating the X Men. He ends up becoming corrupted and set out on a political crusade against mutants, despite having Warren Worthington III as one of his security staff, although Warren kept his mutations a secret in general. Xavier creates a prison in Texas for mutants, in which mutants are deformed, experimented on, or tortured as a means of controlling their mutations, something that he states is done for their own good. Yeah, super dark. And at number 10, Angel of Earth 311. This version of Angel, known as Werner, appears on Earth 311, the Marvel 1602 universe in which all of the Marvel characters exist in the year 1602. Mutants are referred to as witch breed, and the Catholic Church considers them to be devil worshippers, hunting them down. Generally, if a witch breed could pass as a human, the Inquisitor Enrique, the alternate of Magneto on this Earth, would let them survive, with the intention of having them join his brotherhood of those who will inherit the Earth. That is actually the name of his brotherhood. <laughs> Werner had special garments that his mother had made him that hit his wings, but eventually he was found out and fled. The Inquisition, though, threatened that if he did not return, they would kill his mother. So he obeyed, yet they killed her anyway. He was tied up in chains, set to be burned at the stake. That's where the frightful part of his story ends, luckily, with him eventually being rescued and saved from death by the equivalents of Jean Grey, Cyclops, and Iceman. Speaking of Cyclops, though, in at number 9, Cyclops of Earth 200524. This version of Cyclops is gross rather than scary. Hailing from Earth 200524 from the Wahuh comics, this Cyclops Cyclops has an eye infection, and the results ain't pretty to say the least. That's pretty much his whole shtick. The what, huh? Comics are parody comics. Like what, huh? But like what? what? They're parody comics, written in a similar vein as the what if stories, except with a much more comedic spin. Earth 200524 appears in the very first issue of Volume 1 of What, huh? And features the likes of stories titled What If the Avengers All Had Beards? What If DC Let Us Do Batman Daredevil as a Crossover? And What If Black Panther?
Panther were actually white. Yeah, I, get, I think you guys probably get the vibe of what they were going for. <laughs> Moving on to number eight, Robert Drake of Earth 51518. This version of Bobby Iceman Drake comes from the remnants of the Age of Apocalypse reality. Remnants which were salvaged by God Emperor Doom and made into a part of his battle world. It's referred to as the domain of Apocalypse. Now, Iceman has a gruesome reality. Appearing in Old Man Logan issue 2 back in 2015, this Iceman encountered one of Apocalypse's horsemen, Sabretooth, in the Savage Land, and then was seemingly killed by another horseman, Holocaust, who erupted into atomic fire which engulfed the land and Robert. While his teammates were dead, it was revealed that poor Bobby Drake survived, having become a form of pure moisture, which would then evaporate and reconsolidate into a rainstorm that then poured over the X-Men as they fought Apocalypse. Talk about a jarring existence. He's also a much cruder looking version of the character than we're normally used to. And at 7, Ruins Kitty Pride. Ruins is one of the most depressing series in the Marvel multiverse. It's tragic as hell and most of our favorite characters have suffered from terrible fates in this timeline. Ruins takes place on Earth 9591, a place in which all mutants had horrible side effects with their powers. We actually mentioned the version of Professor X on our last part. He became the US president who would then hold mutants in a Texan prison, ordering for them to be experimented on and disfigured for their own good. Kitty Pride is one of those mutants she's imprisoned and in an attempt to escape uses her phasing powers, but that does not go as planned. Instead when she's phasing she gets stuck halfway through a door, causing her to lose 3 feet of her intestines in the process. We never see her die on panel, but it's assumed that, you know, losing a whole 3 out of the 20 feet of intestines that one has inside their body surely wouldn't have the greatest of side effects. There's some science facts for you. We have 20 feet of intestines inside of our bodies. And at number 6, Helverine. Helverine is actually a character who appears on Earth 616. He comes to be after Wolverine's soul was dragged to hell and an unnamed demon decides to take over his body. His whole mission is to ruin everything Wolverine likes in his life, including people. Helverine starts his crusade by going after a pastor that Wolverine had just met prior, covering the pastor's body with insects and stabbing him through the chest, then going over to his church, spraying acid all over it and burning it to the ground while the congregation was inside. Yeah, dark, huh? Luckily, he doesn't get very far when he encounters X-23, who manages to defeat him. Despite that, Helverine goes after the X-Men and almost murders Colossus. He's captured by Mystique, and a ritual is performed to bring Wolverine's soul back to his body. Once Wolverine has returned, he and Helverine duke it out inside of his body, and eventually Jean Grey is able to force the demon out and back to hell. And at 5, Ultimates Nightcrawler. The Ultimates universe, aka Earth 1610, is filled with a whole lot of fascinating but often meaner versions of beloved Marvel characters. Nightcrawler Kurt Wagner definitely falls into that category. Kurt grew up in the Bavarian mountains but was kidnapped for the Weapon X program in his early formative years. He was forced into becoming a mutant agent for them. Once free of the program, he joined up with the X-Men and was generally well liked until, well, he turned out to be a total dick. After he befriended Colossus, the metal mutant came out to him telling Kurt that he was gay. Turns out the Ultimates version of Kurt is a bit of a homophobe and was disgusted by Colossus, telling him that he was dead to him. He eventually grew very lonely and then kidnapped his crush, Dazzler, who at the time was dating Angel, all as a scheme to manipulate her to love him instead. The X-Men had to go after him to rescue Dazzler and Xavier had to put Kurt into a coma in order to rehabilitate him. And at number 4, The Fallen from Earth 1298. We've got another alternative Warren Worthington III on our List, this time from the Mutant X reality. Now, on this Earth, Warren has a very different transformation into one of Apocalypse's horsemen. Rather than being Archangel, he became something referred to as the Fallen. No longer did he have his angelic wings. Instead, his skin became incredibly pale and his wings became bat like, and he was able to breathe fire. Warren, thanks to this transformation, becomes completely conflicted, eventually giving in to all of his dark urges, turning against his allies, and becoming completely cruel and merciless. It even got to the point that no one trusted him anymore, friend or foe. Moving on, to number 3, Charles Xavier from Earth 20329. This Xavier comes from an Earth that's referred to as the steampunk god world, in which the world is ruled by mutant gods. Which seems pretty neat, until this Charles Xavier comes along and he's totally evil and then takes mental control over all of the mutant gods. Xavier was unsatisfied with the gods who ruled over them, so he began to manipulate Storm. He made the gods slaughter millions of innocent people and cause natural disasters like droughts, which made the people of Earth rise up and fight against them, including the version of this Earth's Magneto named Magnus. Together, Together, Xavier Magnus created the secret island of Utopia, a haven of science and technology for mortals. At some point he reveals the truth, freeing the gods from his control, but later would be killed by Magnus because of it. And at number 2, Nazi X-Men. Here we have an Earth, Earth 597, in which the X-Men are Nazis, all thanks to the Nazis winning World War II. They subsequently took over the world. The X-Men here are called the Reichsmen, and consist of Banshee, Storm, Havoc, Psylocke, and Rogue. It is an Earth that appears in Excalibur Weird War 3, Volume 1, Issue 1 from 19. 
1990, where the Nazi universe begins to slip into the 616 universe. The Excalibur team end up having to fight against them, along with Herr Xavier, a German version of Professor X who resembles Joseph Mengele, one of the real life Nazi scientists who was known for his cruel experiments on Jewish prisoners in Holocaust camps. Xavier creates mutants through horrible genetic experiments, including the Reichsmann. So. Fits the bill. And finally, in at number one, Sublime Beast. This version of Hank McCoy comes from Earth 15104, and he's a drug addict, among other things. From the mind of Grant Morrison, this alternate reality is from the writer's Here Comes Tomorrow story arc, in which we get to see a glimpse of a future timeline version of the X Men. It's a post apocalyptic world in which Scott Summers has abandoned his role as the leader of the X Men, leaving Hank to take over, who ends up creating an army of cloned night crawlers in order to take over the world. Hank's having some major trouble keeping things together, and he became incredibly stressed out, so he starts using a drug for mutants called Kick. Being vulnerable, he becomes the new host for Sublime, and wages a war against humanity. That's where the Nightcrawler clones come in. They're called the Crawlers. And in the process, he ends up completely destroying the Xavier Institute. 150 years later, he's still at it, wanting to completely wipe out other species that were not mutants. He manages to find the Phoenix Egg, and resurrects Jean Grey, aka Phoenix, who, seeing him as Beast rather than Sublime, acts as his minion, exterminating races in his name. He takes some of her DNA and duplicates her powers for himself, which then prompts Jean to to remember who she is and purge Sublime from Hank's body. And at number 10, what if Professor X had become the Juggernaut? From What If Issue 13, Volume 2, here we have a story in which Charles Xavier becomes the Juggernaut. It's a simple answer to what would happen. Xavier ends up getting buried alive. But the consequences are much greater. Because of this, he's never able to create the X Men, leaving the Fantastic Four responsible for taking on Magneto. It gets worse, snowballing into some major anti mutant hysteria. Eventually, Xavier manages to dig himself out of the ground, but it's too late for him to try to change the world for the better. He ends up using his super Super strength combined with his powerful psychic abilities to take over the US and enforce anti human laws, using the X Men to do so. In the process, he ends up defeating a lot of major Marvel characters, including the Fantastic Four, Spider Man, Doctor Doom, Iron Man, Daredevil, and even the Hulk. Russia then tries to bomb the US, which is the catalyst for World War III. Xavier steps up, finding a way to make the Earth livable despite all the damage from the bomb, and ends up becoming the supreme leader of the planet. His only ask? That mutants aren't treated like crap. More mutants are born thanks to the bomb radiation, making up almost half of the planet's population. But despite the world finding some sort of peace, Xavier has gone mad, and in secret, the remaining heroes and superpowered characters plot his demise, no longer believing in his dreams since mutants now openly terrorize humans. This leads to a clash between Xavier and several of the X Men on Asteroid M, with Quicksilver using explosives to launch Xavier into space, a potentially temporary solution that leaves Cyclops, Jean Grey, Scarlet Witch, and Quicksilver with the responsibility of trying to repair the world. World in the meantime. Talk about a hefty storyline. And at number nine, what if Wolverine had lived during the age of Conan the Barbarian? Conan the Barbarian has made many an appearance in What If comics over the years. In this story, though, which appears in What If Volume 2, Issue 16, Wolverine is transported to another time. Within the first few panels, he slays a T Rex, impressing the locals. He finds himself completely immersing himself in the culture, getting a new outfit, and not understanding a damn word that anyone is saying. Eventually, he crosses paths with Conan, a battle ensues, and Conan slits Wolverine's throat. Thinking he's killed, him, he walks away, but little does he know that Wolverine has a mutant healing factor. He pursues him, more shenanigans ensue, and Wolverine ends up staying in Conan's world, with Conan being teleported back out to where the X Men are battling on the moon. And he also ends up with Sonya, who looks just like Jean Grey apparently. <sighs> oh, redheads. In at number 8, What If X Men Wedding Album. Issue 60 from Volume 2 of the What If series explored a specific theme. It contains a slew of stories related to Cyclops and Jean Grey's relationship, exploring different facets and possibilities. There's What If Scott Summers and Jean Grey. Had married earlier, which sees the couple marrying earlier on during the beginnings of the mutant team. Another one is What If Scott Summers and Jean Grey had never fallen in love at all, which results in Cyclops leaving the X Men team altogether. Then there's What If Phoenix had fallen for Wolverine, perhaps the most tragic tale of them all, which involves the X Men disbanding, ultimately thanks to the fact that all of the characters die. The framing for the entire issue revolves around the mainstream Earth 616 continuity of Jean and Scott, particularly pertaining to X Men Volume 2, Issue 30, in which the two have their wedding. And at 7, What If Cable had destroyed the X Men? This one comes from What If Volume 2, Issue 46, which was released. Released in 1993. Its narrative follows Charles Xavier returning to Earth after being on a hiatus, only to discover that his X Men teams have all strayed significantly. He holds meetings with each of the teams, only to get into a fight with Cable, in which a battle ensues. Some side with Xavier, while others side with Cable, and Cable ends up fleeing. Later on, he assassinates Xavier along with Jean Grey and Scott Summers, killing them when they least expect it by launching a siren bomb at their dinner table. This causes a major disturbance between the members of all the X teams, dividing them, causing them to fight amongst themselves. 
past. In the meantime, the teams outside of the mutant based ones are forced to pick up the slack. The Avengers and Fantastic Four are fighting off typical X Men villains since the X Men are too busy beating each other up instead. There's a massive fight and Wolverine's team of mutants clashes with Cable's team, killing Cable and his pals. Everything kind of falls apart there. With Magneto swooping in to try to get the remaining members of these battle worn teams to join up with him. And talk about being an opportunist. Can you blame him though? And at six, what if Wolverine was an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D.? This one might be my personal favorite. From What If Volume 2, Issue 7, first released in 1989, here we have Wolverine, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. The timeline diverges from the 616 timeline after Wolverine encounters the Wendigo with the Hulk. After that battle, he goes on loan to S.H.I.E.L.D. for a single mission to help them retrieve a stolen LMD tech. Hydra, of course, is the culprit behind the theft. Nick Fury and Wolverine hunt down the LMD robots and destroy them, one of which includes a decoy of Dum Dum Duggan. Upset about this revelation, Fury sends Wolverine and Black Widow to hunt down any other LMDs possibly infiltrating SHIELD. Turns out half of the crew on board of their ship were robots. The trio then set out to hit Hydra's base and rescue the real Dum Dum, which has them crossing paths with Madame Hydra and Baron Von Strucker, who is in possession of the Satan Claw. A brawl ensues, with SHIELD being victorious. Fury then offers Wolverine a spot permanently on the team, and Logan, wanting a change of pace, agrees. It's around this time on 616 that he'd be joining up with the X-Men anyway. Logan rises in the ranks, becoming Fury's number two, and later on, and later on, Fury is murdered by a Strucker LMD seeking revenge, who takes him out in his flying Ferrari nonetheless. Gotta love the 80s. At Fury's funeral, Dum Dum retires, which makes Logan the new director of SHIELD. This has a powerful domino effect on the world. Using SHIELD, Wolverine prevents several major events in the Marvel Universe, including the creation of Sentinels, Dark Phoenix's emergence, there's no Mutant Registration Act, and overall, it improves human and mutant relations for the better. Kind of hurts to see the potential Logan had at SHIELD, doesn't it? But on a different note, fun fact, another story in this issue is what if Aunt May was a mutant with claws? So I guess, I mean, that's one hell of a reminder that this is a what if issue. In at number 5, what if the X-Men had stayed in Asgard? Based on the comic New Mutants Special Edition issue 1, what if the X-Men had stayed in Asgard is a riff off of a story in which concluded with them leaving Asgard to return to Earth. The premise is very self explanatory here. The X-Men all vote and those who wish to leave are sent home by Loki. The rest of the story follows the lives of these remaining X-Men and how they assimilate into Asgardian culture. Rogue finds love, being able to touch the Asgardian people. Mirage becomes a Valkyrie. Storm becomes the goddess of thunder, and Loki attempts to trick her into slaying his brother, who has been transformed into a frog. Hela then attacks Asgard and the X-Men alongside Thor, who is eventually transformed back to his normal self, fight her and her army. They defeat her and Thor returns to Earth, giving Storm the throne and Asgard to rule. And Loki? Well, for the tricks that he played in getting the X-Men to stay, he slowly goes mad by the end of the comic, thanks to the ones who sit above in shadow. Moving on to number 4, what if the new X-Men had died on their very first mission? Coming out of What If Volume 2, Issue 9, this comic book has a wonderful cover. It's Charles Xavier being pushed away from the X-Men's funeral by Beast. Shouting out up into the heavens, the X-Men are dead and I killed them! The concept for this one places the original X-Men and the new X-Men being killed off on their mission, with Xavier telepathically feeling each and every one of their deaths. Beast, the only X-Men member to not have gone on this mission, tries to console the depressed Xavier. Count Nefaria sees how weakened the X-Men are and attacks, which forces Beast into forming a new ragtag team that consists of himself, Scarlet Witch, Quicksilver, Siren, Warpath, and Namorita, the female version of Namor. Mm. This new team end up fighting and defeating Count Nefaria, and Xavier, seeing this new team all put together, begins to come out of his depression, asking the new team to stay on and become official X Men. All works out for the best. I mean, except, you know, all of the original ones are dead, but hey. Moving on to number three, what if Wolverine had killed the Hulk? From What If Volume 1, Issue 13, we see a rehashing of Wolverine's first appearance in the comics, when he first crossed paths with the Hulk in The Incredible Hulk issue. 181. Although he technically made a cameo in the issue prior, but I mean, cameo. It was like in a panel. Now, in that story, Wolverine and the Hulk initially see each other as a threat before teaming up together to take down the Wendigo. But in this story, though, Wolverine and the Hulk duke it out. And rather than being interrupted by the Wendigo, which initially causes them to stop fighting each other, the Wendigo never shows up. This ends up resulting in Wolverine fatally wounding the Hulk, and leads to him fleeing from authorities despite his attacks being out of self defense. Because he's on the run, he doesn't join the X Men. Instead, he teams up with Magneto and joins the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. With his his first assignment being to infiltrate the X Men. He does, but in the process, grows close to the mutant team, and when the time comes for him to double cross them, he just can't do it. Instead, he turns on Magneto, and Magneto and Wolverine fights, with them killing each other in the process. And at number two, what if Wolverine was Lord of the Vampires? <laughs> this one's great. Here's a what if story that should be familiar to some of you who frequent our channel. From What If Volume 2, Issue 24, what if Wolverine was Lord of the Vampires?
vampires tells the tale of Wolverine and the X-Men crossing paths with none other than Count Dracula. The two fight and Wolverine gets bitten, becoming a vampire himself. But thanks to his will power he's able to evade Dracula's mind control abilities and ends up fighting him for dominance. Wolverine succeeds and kills him, and then proceeds to transform all of the other X-Men into vampires, with him and his new army going around biting beloved heroes and draining them of their… well… Their blood. Eventually, for some reason that I swear totally makes sense, Doctor Strange has taken over the body of the Punisher and goes after Wolverine, and manages to get through to Logan in the end, stopping his blood reign of terror. And finally, in at number one, what if Phoenix had not died? From What If, issue 27, volume 1, we see the Watcher looking into an alternate reality in which Jean Grey did not die during the incursion with the Shi'ar. Rather, she was reborn. And when the X Men find themselves facing off against Galactus and Terax in the Shi'ar galaxy, the Phoenix rises and Kick some serious butt, stopping Galactus. But something is not right. Jean Grey is overwhelmed by the Phoenix Force and ends up losing control, destroying a star. Once back home on Earth at the X Mansion, Kitty Pride confronts Jean about the star that she destroyed. This does not bode well. Jean loses it and becomes Dark Phoenix, killing Kitty in response. The X Men attempt to stop her, but her rampage continues. She ends up killing Polaris. Cyclops tries to intervene too, but Phoenix murders him as well. And it only gets worse from there. Jean entirely loses control and the Phoenix Force engulfs the entire world, destroying it, with it continuing to expand in the universe, consuming it all bit by bit. Talk about depressing. Number 10, Dirty Bomb Wolverine. Why does this sound like some sort of sexy nickname for Wolverine? It really is not. Instead, this alternate version of Wolverine is an empty clone that was created in the current Wolverine series and used to basically burn vampires loyal to Dracula from the inside out. This all went down in a battle in the effort of freeing Omega Red from Dracula's hold over him, while also getting back at Drac who was attempting to get his hands on Wolverine so he could use his blood to allow his own vampire army to walk around during the day, making them obviously much more powerful. Omega Red's plan to stop Dracula was to give him what he wanted, which meant making a clone of Wolverine who was gene edited to have blood that was thick with photonic cells, similar to the ones found in Plankton which produced their own luminescence. Basically the blood of the dirty bomb clone Wolverine that then had the opposite effect on the vamps who consumed it, meaning they would be burnt from the inside out as opposed to being able to walk in the day. Having a gene edited clone of Wolverine is a frightening prospect and a clone who is used simply as a decoy and bomb is pretty morally scary. And then there is the added factor of how it made the vampires feel to learn of it. And I'm sure that they were properly terrified before they were all killed. Minus Dracula of course who got away in the end, like he always does. Although the mutants won the battle in issue number 12. 12 of the current Wolverine series, they did not win the war. Still continues with the vampire nation. Number 9. Dark Claw. If you find the Batman scary, and I mean, who doesn't? He is often drawn with the intention of looking intimidating and scary enough to strike fear into the hearts of goons and villains all across Gotham. Then take a seat because Dark Claw is definitely going to spook you a bit here. Dark Claw comes to us from the Amalgam universe where he was created as a cross between Marvel's Wolverine and DC's Batman, blending together two of the big two's most popular and frightening heroic characters. He's got the backstory and fortune of Batman, but still boasts of the adamantium coated skeleton and healing factor of Wolverine. Meaning that Logan Wayne is not an alternate version that you would want to mess with. And all my ghouls out there, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more Wolverine lists, be sure to let us know by clicking that like button and commenting down below. Also if you click like and if you smash subscribe, you can call me Vampy. Number 8. Phoenix. One of the most terrifying versions of Wolverine in terms of what he could be capable of has to be the Wolverine from the alternate future where Thor ends up as Allfather and Loki wipes out all of humanity, just to make his brother suffer, of course. In this dystopian future, Wolverine himself ends up being chosen to become the new host for the Phoenix Force after his own death. Phoenix Logan was obviously capable of many different insane feats due to him being imbued with, well, the Phoenix Force, even managing to save Loki from the Celestials. Pretty impressive. However, Phoenix Wolverine would prove to be not quite as scary when facing a future version of Doom who obliterated him. But Logan, being imbued with the power of the Phoenix Force, meant that he could resurrect and in order to ensure that Doom would be defeated this time around, he sacrificed himself to empower Allfather Thor's weapon Mjolnir in the continued battle. Also, that would be the one really powerful Mjolnir. It's like Mjolnir with the Phoenix Force. That's crazy. Number 7, Akahiro. Sure, 
Sure, Dokken is a character all his own, but I also counted a clone that was used as a dirty bomb against vampires, so I feel like if I do that, it would be really insulting if we did not talk about Akihiro. Dokken was an alternate version of Wolverine during Dark Reign, where Norman Osborn basically took over in the comics, where he forged the organization Hammer and there and his very own Dark Avengers. The Dark Avengers were made up of former and current villains repurposed and remarketed as Avengers replacements. Osborn actually tried to recruit some of the original Avengers after they'd been disbanded, but of course they pretty much all refused. They were like, we know you're Norman Osborn, so. Dokken was recruited to be Dark Wolverine on the team, and while Akihiro might not be quite as villainous in the comics currently, at the time he was still pretty much one of the baddies. Dokken is a terrifying alternate because he is less of a moral code than his dad, who already isn't known for his light touch when it comes to dealing with his opponents. Dokken, like his father, is also a skilled fighter and assassin who was trained since he was a child to become a killer and a weapon for Romulus to use against Logan. Oh, and if you're not familiar with him, he also has pretty much all the powers of his dad. His claws are just a little bit different. Actually, Dokken also has pheromone powers, so he's not really more powerful than his dad in terms of skill, but power set. Just saying. Number 6. Wolverine Noir Jim Logan is one of the noir versions of Wolverine that we see in the Marvel Noirverse. Another shows up in the X-Men Noir series, but with a different backstory and also kind of a different name. He's a bootlegger, but the one we're focusing on here is a detective. Honestly, a lot of the noir versions of heroes are detectives. But back then in the stories, everyone was a detective, so I'm fine with it. Either way, I personally think that narrative fits Wolverine's power set just a little bit better, being a skilled tracker himself. Jim in Wolverine Noir is part of Logan and Logan, a detective agency that boasts that they're the best there is at what we do. The whole look of the series is very creepy, very noir, and it also draws a lot on the backstory of Wolverine given to us in his origin series, where we learn of how he was mistreated as a boy, his relationship to Dog, and his childhood love and friend, Rose. In this version of the story, Logan's father is a very religious preacher who often forces young Jim to sit and listen to his sermons while he rehearses them. Number 5. Old Man Logan Definitely one of the scariest alternate versions of Wolverine out there when it comes to the reality in which he resides. Old Man Logan hails from the alternate reality of Earth 807-128. In this reality, it was Wolverine himself who was responsible for the death of the X-Men as he was tricked by Mysterio into slaughtering all of them when the villains took over and ended up finally winning the day. Flash forward to the future where Wolverine is old and he doesn't go by that code name anymore because well, it brings back pretty painful memories, which he still is haunted by to this day. Instead, he's simply known as Logan. But even though he tries to stay away from heroics, retiring, and even settling down with a wife and kids, he can't seem to escape his vigilante ways. After his family are killed when he is late to pay forced protection money to the Hulk gang, Logan himself seeks revenge, inevitably and gruesomely freeing pretty much everyone from the villainous nature of deranged Pappy Banner and his inbred family. That Hulk gang. Oh boy. Number 4. Cancer vs. Wolverine We don't know that much about Cancer vs. Wolverine, who hails from the Earth of 10011, but we do know like many others who hail from this reality, Wolverine here is horrifying to behold, and he is part of the X-Men, spelt E-X-Men. In the Cancer verse, death was completely eradicated, which you might think would bring about a sort of paradise in the cosmos, but instead this change had, well, the opposite effect, mutating everything into one big horror show. Turns out death wasn't quite as bad as we all thought, and that life, left unchecked, is actually horrifying. Who would have guessed? Number 3, X-24 In the film Logan, X-24 was an even more deadly clone than X-23. This was a clone version of Wolverine genetically engineered to be as powerful as Wolverine in his prime, perhaps even more so, and who was much more easy to control and manipulate. Not as free thinking, and just more of a straight up berserker. So basically like Wolverine without any of his moral code at all, or any in inhibitions. This made X-24 the perfect weapon to be used against Wolverine himself and escapee Laura, aka X-23. It took a lot to take down X-24 and his perceived strength and ruthlessness in the film made him a terrifying nemesis to watch. I don't know about you, but I got so anxious every time he showed up on screen in that initial watch through of Logan. Ugh, even, even when I rewatch it now, I'm like, Ugh, Logan, no, X-24 is coming for you, run! Number 2, Lord of the Vampires. This alternate version of Wolverine comes to us from the What If series, Volume 2 issue 24. Here the 
fate of the world was forever changed when during the X-Men's battle with Dracula, Storm ultimately decided to remain with Dracula. This changed the course of history forever as Wolverine and the other heroes were captured and transformed into vampires themselves. However, Wolverine's willpower proved much too strong for Dracula to tame or control. And so, he was challenged and later defeated by Wolverine, who then became the new Lord of the Vampires. What's scarier than a Terminator style clone version of Wolverine? How about a vampire version of Wolverine who rules over all of the other vampires and can turn anyone into his loyal thrall? Number 1. Zombieverse Wolverine Actually, I feel a little bad that I put the zombies above the vampires in this list, but here we are. I don't know how, but I almost actually forgot to mention Zombie vs. Wolverine on this list. I guess maybe it's just because I'm so fixated on vampires, which I guess makes sense. But it's really shocking considering how emotionally scarring and overall how terrifying I find the Zombieverse in Marvel to be. It's just, just a real horror show over there. Over on Earth Z or Earth 2149, Wolverine isn't just any old zombie either, but becomes one of the zombie cosmic or zombie galacti. After he and a group of chosen few fight over and successfully devour Galactus's remains. For a long time, this granted zombie Wolverine the power cosmic, so not only was he now a terrifying member of the undead with Wolverine's killer instincts and fighting prowess, but then he also had the power cosmic on top of that. Wow. Coming in at number 10, we have the bloodthirsty vampire Wolverine. In an alternate universe where vampires have launched an all out assault on the United States, most of the X-Men are bitten and mind controlled by the lord of the vampires, Dracula. Unfortunately for Dracula, however, Wolverine's healing ability allows him to regain his own mental control despite becoming a vampire and thus is able to overthrow Dracula and become leader of the vampires. Consumed by a bloodlust that amplifies his already pretty frightening rage, Wolverine and his vampire army are able to wipe out most other superpowered life on the planet, only finally being defeated by the combined forces of Doctor Strange and the Punisher as a vampire hunting combination. Coming in at number 9, we have the evil Iceman hailing from the Age of Apocalypse universe. In a world where Apocalypse has taken over mutant kind and only Magneto and a few X-Men are capable of fighting back, the usually optimistic Bobby Drake was forged into a heartless warrior, giving him much stronger control of his ice powers than other depictions of Iceman, and becoming a living streak of ice that can travel instantaneously through water. This version of Iceman would eventually betray his teammates and ally himself with Dark Beast, and was only eventually able to be defeated by having his head shoved inside of a furnace. Which I guess is one way to kill an ice based villain, but geez, that's a little bit overkill. Coming in at number 8, we have the brainwashed Wolverine of Earth 14850. At one point in the regular Marvel Universe, Wolverine was captured and brainwashed by Hydra in order to assassinate the Avengers, but luckily was able to be deprogrammed before he did any real damage. On this alternate Earth, however, the deprogramming never took place, and Wolverine's killing spree of superpowered heroes was able to last for months. Armed with all of his incredible abilities, absolutely no remorse, and the addition of Hydra developed teleporting technology that nullified even Wolverine's usual weaknesses, and this was a horrifying enemy that even the Avengers couldn't handle. Coming in at number 7, we have Basilisk, the twisted mask wearing variant of Cyclops. On an alternate world where anti-mutant sentiment is somehow even higher than the regular Marvel Universe, Scott Summers' backstory is made even more tragic. Killing seven people, including his own parents when his powers first manifest, Cyclops is locked away in the prison Alcatraz and forced to wear a mask made of ruby quartz to control his laser vision. The evil governor of the prison even goes so far as to mutilate Cyclops and remove his eyelids, making the twisted basilisk mask the only method Scott has to control his deadly abilities, a favor that Cyclops would repay by killing the governor and 
and launching a prison break that would eventually lead him back to this universe's X-Men. Coming in at number 6, we're taking a bit of a break from the comics with the Wolverine symbiote from the video game Spider-Man Web of Shadows. In this game's story, Wolverine has traveled to New York City to deal with a growing symbiote infestation and even briefly fights Spider-Man when he believes the wall crawler is actually Venom. Unfortunately for Wolverine, he finds himself overwhelmed by actual symbiotes on top of a church and attacks Spider-Man again as the Wolverine symbiote. With all of his usual healing abilities on top of all the usual symbiote enhancements, this version of Wolverine might just be the scariest he's ever been. Coming in at number 5, we have the Ultimate Universe version of Jamie Madrox, aka Multiple Man. Multiple Man's powers have always been a bit overwhelming, with the ability to seemingly create an unlimited amount of duplicates of himself as long as they're generated one at a time. In the Ultimate Universe, however, this power was pushed beyond its limits when Jamie allied himself with the Brotherhood of Mutants and created tens of thousands of bomb-wielding versions of himself with no regard for his own life. While the Ultimatum event featured many shocking moments, few are as existentially disturbing as literal thousands of clones strapping explosives to themselves just to wipe out several superhero bases. Coming in at number 4, we have the possessed Professor X from Earth 6141. During the event known as M-Day, when Scarlet Witch wiped out most of mutant kind, the extremely powerful telepath known as the Shadow King was able to escape the loss of his powers by transferring his mind through the multiverse to the alternate world of Earth 6141, where he was able to successfully possess the mind of this world's Charles Xavier before the X-Men were even formed. Combining both of their telepathic might, this version of Xavier turned all of his students into perfect killing machines and placed them firmly under his psychic control, getting them to kill any superheroes who tried to interfere in the Shadow King's schemes. While eventually defeated by the team known as New Excalibur, this group of Shadow X-Men left their world shaking in terror. Coming in at number 3, we have the Vampire Variant of Storm, aka Bloodstorm. In an alternate reality where Storm was bitten by Dracula before discovering the X-Men, Storm came to Charles Xavier for help with her condition. Unfortunately, her bloodlust was too strong and she wound up feasting on both the Professor and Beast. Horrified at what she'd done, this version of Storm would eventually try and redeem herself after she found herself as part of an invasion force attacking the main Marvel Universe. While she eventually bonded and made amends with the beast of this dimension, her combination of weather controlling and vampire powers made Bloodstorm one of the more powerful X-Men variants that the regular X-Men have ever had to face. Coming in at number 2, we have one of the most powerful enemies the X-Men have ever seen with Brother Mutant. On Earth-127, a male variant of the Scarlet Witch, known as the Scarlet Warlock, attempted to cast a spell that would transfer Wolverine's adamantium skeleton to Magneto, thus giving Magneto an incredible power boost given his magnetic abilities. However, something with the spell went wrong, and the Scarlet Warlock, Wolverine, Magneto, Quicksilver, and the villain Mesmero were all merged into a singular being known as Brother Mutant. With all five of these mutants' powers combined into one villainous figure, Brother Mutant was such a powerful threat that a multiversal team of Wolverines had to be assembled specifically to stop him, just to ensure that all of that power wasn't unleashed on the rest of the Marvel Multiverse. And finally, coming in at our top spot, we have the one and only Magneto from the Ultimate Universe. Unlike a lot of the other entries on this list, this Magneto variant doesn't have any additional powers or physical mutations to make him even more intimidating, but rather is terrifying just because of his sheer willpower. This version of Magneto is much more cynical and dark than the complex figure of the regular Marvel Universe, and when he believed his children had been killed by Doctor Doom, Ultimate Magneto was furious enough to begin a global genocide. 
Switching the polarity of Earth's poles with his magnetic powers and beginning the incredibly controversial event known as Ultimatum, this version of Magneto caused the deaths of millions of people and dozens of beloved superheroes, and was only finally able to be stopped when Cyclops put him out of his misery with a laser blast to the head. Number 10. Wither Kevin Ford, or better known as Wither, was a former student of Xavier's school for gifted youngsters. He was a mutant with the power of organic decay, which means basically when he touched any form of organic matter, it would break down the binding forces between the molecules and cause whatever he's touching to wither away. <laughs> Get his name now. He wasn't really all that great at controlling it though. When he first arrived at the school, he was a bit of a loner, but he eventually made some friends. He was especially close with Laurie Collins, also known as Wallflower. Years later, during the House of M storyline, he touched Laurie's arm and accidentally ended up crippling her. He then decided to run away and was recruited by Selene to fight against the X Men. Number nine, Bishop. Lucas Bishop, or better known as Bishop has a very, very interesting story. You see, his mission was to travel back and to find a traitor in the X-Men and stop this terrible future that he was living in. Pretty straightforward, right? Well, not exactly. After Scarlet Witch wiped out a ton of the mutant population, Hope Summers appeared, and everyone saw her as some sort of mutant messiah. Bishop then realizes that she is partially responsible for the terrible future that he lives in and will stop at nothing to kill her. He even ends up betraying the X-Men, which in turn makes him realize that he is the traitor that he was looking for all along. And instead of killing Hope, he ends up killing Cable. And now, in the future, he is known as a villain. That's pretty crazy. I really messed up. Number 8. Colossus. Colossus is generally seen as a really nice guy. I mean, look how he's portrayed in the Deadpool films. People just absolutely love him. But unfortunately, he has turned to the dark side. He ended up suffering a brain injury, and then shortly after, he lost his sister to something known as the Legacy Virus, which took the lives of a lot of mutants. Because of this, he ends up siding with Magneto for a little while and goes against the X-Men. But he does eventually return to the side of good. But he was evil, which is why he is on this list. Number seven, Gambit. Gambit technically started out as a villain. He was a con man and thief, but he did, you know, eventually become a hero. He's one of the most famous and most popular, you know, of the X-Men. He has been a part of multiple events and stories where he saved the world. But at one point, he did go back to being evil. Not entirely his fault, though. It was kind of, you know, for Apocalypse. Which you'll be hearing about more as this list goes on. He became one of Apocalypse's four horsemen and tried to kill his friends. He didn't stay that way forever, and he rejoined the team later on and has continued to be a crucial part of the team going forward. Number six, Iceman. In the Age of Apocalypse universe, Bobby Drake, aka Iceman, is not the one we know and love. In the original universe, he's, you know, a nice guy that you could just rely on. He is a crucial part of the X-Men and has saved hundreds of people. But that's not the case in the Apocalypse timeline. This Bobby ends up turning against his team, to the point where he even reveals the location of the X-Men super secret underwater base to Wolverine, who was also working for Apocalypse at the time. Not cool, Bobby. Not cool. Although, he didn't really get away with it. Later on, he ended up being killed by Nightcrawler. So, you know. Number five, Namor. Namor has a very interesting relationship with people who live on land. And by interesting, I mean it's pretty rocky. He usually is not a fan of them. Although, he has worked with them, you know, before, and even allowed the X-Men to operate in the ocean. But that hasn't always been the case. He has consistently let his hatred of the land cloud his judgment, to the point where he has had multiple fights with not only just the X-Men, but the Avengers. He also has a lot of beef with Tony Stark, aka Iron Man. The two have had so many fights that I have lost count. Number four, Cyclops. Usually Scott Summers is a stand-up guy, known as one of the most famous leaders of the X-Men. And when you think of him, evil is not really a word that would come to mind. But it has happened to Scott before. It started during the Schism storyline, where his leadership skills were questioned. He began sending out young mutants on assassination missions, which is kind of weird. And then his leadership, you know, was obviously questioned, leading to a massive brawl with none other than Wolverine. This whole arc led into the Avengers vs. X-Men storyline. In Avengers vs. X-Men, he ended up becoming possessed by the Phoenix Force and he killed Charles Xavier. Of course, that wasn't entirely his fault, since, you know, he couldn't really control it. Number three, Angel. Warren Worthington III is a mutant, well, with, you know, you guessed it, wings. He's a proud member of the X-Men, but ended up becoming their enemy. 
Archangel. He becomes one of Apocalypse's four horsemen. He did eventually break free from Apocalypse, but the whole encounter really just changed him going forward. Warren was never really the same after that. He has consistently wavered between good and evil, sometimes going back and referring to himself as Angel, and then other times becoming bad and becoming Archangel. Number two, Wolverine. Wolverine becoming bad is a really new thing. I mean, there have been multiple instances in the comics where Wolverine has become evil. During the Apocalypse storyline, where he was one of uh, Apocalypse's four horsemen, or the time where his body was taken over by a demon and he became Hellbreed and caused all sorts of mayhem, or there's even the time where he became a vampire. He also even murdered a kid in the Ultimate Universe. It's just, the list goes on and on. But, at the same time, that doesn't take away from how iconic Logan is. He's just this amazing hero and will always stay that way, regardless, you know, if he turns evil sometimes. Number one, Jean Grey. This is probably one of, if not the most famous story in X-Men history, the Dark Phoenix Saga. Fans adore it. It was this massive, action-packed, heartbreaking event. I mean, it's so popular that they've even tried to make it into two movies. Fans weren't really crazy about them, but the fact that it was adapted twice really shows you how popular it is. Jean Grey becomes Dark Phoenix after harnessing the power of the Phoenix Force, one of the most powerful things in the whole Marvel Universe. This tragic tale also does not have a happy ending. I mean, on the one hand, Jean managed to become herself again, but in order for her to save everyone, she had to die which had massive ramifications on the rest of the team going forward. At number 10, Emma Frost. Now, when you see Emma Frost, it's not like you're just gonna be like, Ugh. you know, she's so scary. But it's her looks aren't what make her scary. It's everything else. Emma is a powerful telepath who can also turn her skin into a nearly indestructible diamond material. Also, she is known to play both sides. Not only has she been an enemy of the X-Men, but she has also been part of the team. So she's not only powerful, but she's smart and sneaky. Number nine, Omega Red. Arkady Rozovich was a mutant with the ability to heal and release pheromones that would eventually kill any organic life they came in contact with. His powers made him a prime candidate for essentially the Russian version of the Weapon X program. Because of this experiment, he ended up becoming super enhanced. He also has metal tentacles that can retract and, can, and he can control them at will. Now, this guy was a terrible person even before he became one of the scariest X-Men villains. He kidnapped and killed numerous girls over the years, so the fact that he became that enhanced after all that is a very, very scary thought. Number eight, Sabretooth. Victor Creed, also known as the villainous Sabretooth. <laughs> oh man, every time I hear Sabretooth or just his name Victor, all I can think of is this Hugh Jackman yelling out like, Victor, whenever he's angry. Oh man, I miss Hugh Jackman. He was so good as Wolverine. Okay, but back to Sabretooth. He is a mutant who was enhanced by the Weapon X program, one of his main abilities being his healing factor. He also has enhanced hearing, sight, taste, smell, and he can see in the dark. He also has enhanced strengths and claws instead of fingernails, and super sharp fangs. Plus, his bones are now laced with adamantium, so it makes him even creepier. Number seven, Dark Beast. Dark Beast is an evil version of, you know, normal Beast, aka Hank McCoy, from the Age of Apocalypse reality. In this timeline, the X-Men were never formed because Charles Xavier died before, you, you know, that could happen. And in this timeline, Hank doesn't have the support and guidance of Professor X, and kind of goes a bit crazy with his experiments because he is working for Apocalypse. He basically experiments and tortures mutants in this timeline, which he kind of enjoys. And some of his victims included Scott Summers and Jean Grey. Number six, Mystique. Mystique, also known as Raven, is one of the most dangerous mutants around. Why? Well, because she can shapeshift into anyone or anything. And not only will her looks change, but she can perfectly match their voice and outfit. She has caused the X-Men so much trouble over the years. One thing to note is that she can't actually take the powers of the person she transforms into. You know, if she could do that, she would be the most powerful mutant of all time. On top of being able to change her appearance, she is a very skilled fighter and assassin. Number five, Juggernaut. Kane Marco, also known as the Juggernaut. Now, this guy, you don't want to mess with. Also, in the main universe, he's not a mutant. He's just the stepbrother of Professor X and is powered by the Crimson Gem of Ciderac. But in the Ultimate Universe, he is a mutant, so that's why he's on the list. So, in that universe, he has super strength, durability, speed, and stamina, and when he starts running, almost nothing can stop him. Also, fun fact, in the Ultimate Universe, he was later enhanced by the Crimson Gen of Ciderac, which made him even stronger. It just wasn't his primary source of power here. Number four, Mr. Sinister. While he's technically not a full mutant, he also 
kind of is. I mean, when he was transformed into Mr. Sinister by Apocalypse, he technically mutated and acquired abilities, so yeah, you know. He had to be on the list. After being enhanced, he now can shapeshift, has accelerated healing, super strength, speed, durability, and telepathy, and he just looks super creepy. Number three, Dark Phoenix. Coming from one of the most popular X-Men stories ever written, I mean, there's a reason that they have attempted to adapt it twice, is Dark Phoenix, who we also know as Jean Grey. While the X-Men were on a mission, they were trying to save a crew in space that were trapped in a shuttle. In order for them not to die of radiation, someone had to come aboard the ship and drive it back. That person turned out to be Jean. She could instantly learn how to fly the shuttle, but also she was able to shield herself from all that radiation. Eventually, the radiation started to kill her, and she cried out for help, and the Phoenix Force answered. It saved Jean, but while her actual body was healing, it created its own copy of Jean. She eventually went on to become evil, and with the Phoenix Force, she is insanely powerful. She can absorb and dish out endless amounts of energy, can travel through space completely unharmed, and has maxed out psychic abilities. Number two, Apocalypse. Apocalypse is believed to be one of the very first mutants. He was born in Egypt around 3000 BC. He was born with gray skin, blue lips, and natural markings on his body. He believes that only the strong should be able to live, regardless of you know if they're mutants or just superpowered being. He's basically immortal, has super strength, teleportation, telekinesis, telepathy, self-molecular manipulation. Ooh, that's a mouthful. Which essentially means he can alter his own body almost any way he wants. He could also just grow as big as he wants, or he can shrink to be the smallest thing in the world. He can even shoot energy and absorb massive amounts of energy. He's just Scary and powerful. Number one, Magneto. Okay, so he may not be the scariest looking mutant, but trust me when I say this, Magneto is the scariest mutant villain around. Not only does he have the ability to control all forms of metal, making him one of the most powerful mutants, but he can also control people. And no, he doesn't have an actual mutant ability to control people. What I mean is there is a reason so many mutants follow and trust him. He has this natural quality that allows him to manipulate and lead people. He believes what he is doing is right, and because of that, so do his followers. They will do anything for him. You know, he may be evil, but he doesn't come across that way. He truly makes people believe that anyone who doesn't see it his way is the enemy. Magneto just doesn't see himself as a villain, and neither do his followers. And because of that, he is the scariest mutant of all. Kicking off the list at number 10, we have Hope Summers. Making her first debut in X-Men Volume 2, Issue 205, Hope Summers is the first mutant born post-M-Day. She was born in Alaska and Cerebro just went off the charts, it went nuts. So the purifiers immediately attacked. They were tipped off by a time-traveling sentinel, Nimrod. So Cable came in at the same time and eventually saved her, but as for everybody else in that town, well, they didn't get so lucky. Cable saw the child as a Messiah, the savior for mutants and humankind. But Bishop and the purifiers were on a different page. They believed she would become a full on super villain. They thought the death toll would be 1 million after just six minutes. That's like, you can make rice in six minutes and then a million people are dead. That's bad news, that's bad news. And then after that, it would obviously only get worse, according to Bishop and his future knowledge. So the future clock was ticking. Hope learned how to fight by studying Cable and the strain 88 virus that recharged Rogue's power would kill anybody with just one touch. It was so much that Rogue fell into a coma. But when Hope was taken from Mystique, she was pressed against Rogue's face, and not only did she survive, but she also healed Rogue at the same time. Just like Jean Grey, Hope too was attracting the Phoenix Force, so when the Avengers came along offering to protect the child later on, that just led into Avengers vs X-Men. So yeah, she's a little important, we can say that. Number 9, Brother Nathan. Brother. Here we go. Making his first debut in Cable and Deadpool issue 16, Nathan Summers from Earth 58161 found peace. Ah, we'd love to see it. Now at this point, humans were done relying on television and all that crap. Instead, they used their imagination to explore and expand the humankind. How lovely is that? Wonderful. What a future. So our 616 Deadpool came along looking for the missing Cable, and that's where he ended up. He ended up here. Cable, or in this time, Brother Nathan that is, found Wade telekinetically and gave him the rundown. This pitch, this new peaceful environment that he created wasn't actually boring like Wade believed. 
and only three minutes later, Wade was gone. He got out of there. He couldn't do it. Only Cannonball and Siren from this Earth followed him back through Dimension. So he ended up getting in trouble by this quick visit. Brother Nathan is cool though. He's a cool dude. There's a ban on weapons in this timeline, but Nathan had this cool looking spear with a ceremonial blue tassel under the blade. It wasn't for combat, but more for keepsake purposes. And look at him. He looks like a nice dude. He kind of looks like the Lord, dare I say. Also, this world is beautiful. It feels like No Man's Sky meets Wakanda. That's a nice place to be. And before we continue on with this list, if you want to go ahead and give us a thumbs up, that would be so great. It's so helpful here at the channel. You guys are the best. Now let's get right back into this awesome part three. Let's do it. Number eight, White Sword. Among the many mutants residing on Okara, one was known simply as White Sword, or White Sword of the Ivory Spire, which rolls off the tongue a little nicer. He made his first appearance in X-Men Volume 5, Issue 12, during the Ten of Swords storyline. The White Sword and his army of 100 champions were sent to Ament. They battled and bought the mutants some time. So when the dust was settled, White Sword vanished. He never returned with his people again, and after the mutants were trapped in Ament, they saw all these demons who had been crucified, so they knew that the White Sword was there, just kicking ass all along. Now he was an ally to the mutants of Okara, but after that, many, many years of endless war and resurrection, he eventually started to lose his mind, as one would. He would start attacking his friends as well as enemies. He just couldn't see the difference. I mean, as if living a thousand years wasn't bad enough, imagine having to spend it constantly fighting for your life. But he is quite good at fighting. He's a master at sword combat, and if he does decide to heal you after a battle, you'll then be enlisted to his army by default. Nice. Number seven, Zorn. Jean Grey, this time from Earth 13729. This gene first appeared in X-Men Battle of the Atom, issue one. Zorn, well rather Professor Zorn that is, was a teacher at the Jean Grey School for Higher Learning, and this is the past gene grown up, right? That's important to say. Battle of the Atom was a crossover event where the future X-Men travel back to the original five, but they weren't exactly X-Men though. They were future Brotherhood of Mutant members, led by Charles Xavier the second and Rays, those two villain kids. So Jean Grey went by Zorn and rocked the skull helmet. It was a vibe, it was a pretty good look. The team wanted to force the OG back to the past and prevent their future. Now this version of Jean didn't have the Phoenix Force attached to her, but she was still able to take on Emma Frost. She was quite powerful. The dialogue alone is pretty great here. Jean is asking Jean what happens in the future. That makes her such a what a way to put it, right to the punch. Now this version of Jean can't go more than a few minutes without Zorn's containment helmet, and she has similar powers as our other Jean that we know, only they grow in strength this time around. It's trouble. Number six, James Braddock Jr. First appearing in Captain Britain issue nine, Jamie Braddock Jr., the oldest son, of course, from Dr. James and Lady Elizabeth Braddock. And when I say oldest, he's 10 years older than his siblings, the twins, Betsy and Brian Braddock. Now, Jamie can manipulate reality, but it never started that way. He was brilliant when it came to finances, and if that's too buy the books for you and not cool enough, he was also a pro race car driver. Nice. He found out about his brother's secret identity, and then he helped out here and there as a supporting character to his comic run. But Jamie started to get behind on bills, so he resorted to crime. First starting with minor crimes, and then as these debts grew, he had to get really dark and grimy with his actions. Eventually, Dr. Crocodile kidnapped him, told Brian about his brother's crime work, and his brother kind of just let him go, right? Doc Croc was evil. After these experiments, Jamie was convinced that this reality that he lives in is actually just a dream, and his mind was just breaking. It was sad stuff. This just happened to be the tipping point for Jamie to meet his mutant power, which also happened to be the ability to warp and restructure reality in his immediate vicinity. Terrible, powerful combo right there, troublesome. He views the world as invisible strings that he plucks away at. It's like Interstellar style. Murph. Number five. Archangel. Warren's wings are pretty amazing as is, but during the X-Force storyline, he got the upgrade of a lifetime. He got techno-organic wings by Apocalypse after he became the Horseman of Death. The old H-O-D. Sometimes they work. I thought he was powerful before, but this is just another level. His feathers were much stronger this time around as the horseman, and he could fire them off like bullets. They could pierce right through steel, or he could use the wings to smash and fly through anything. Either or. The techno-organic wings regrew afterwards for a second time, along with the new blue skin tone to match Apocalypse. Now this form of angel is hard to keep away. He often struggles to keep his heroic side in control. If Apocalypse made me a horseman of death and I got all that extra power, I'd be pretty annoyed having it taken away every now and then. 
I get it. Number four, Nathaniel Gray. This mutant is from an alternate reality, like some of our other ones that we talk about. He styles himself as a mutant shaman, loaded with precognition, telepathy, telekinesis. Who is he? Let's talk about him. Coming from Earth 295, artificially created from Sinister and the High Lord Apocalypse, Nate Gray is made of genetic materials from Cyclops and Jean Gray. He was created to be the ultimate telepath, and I think it kind of worked. He was made as a power bid to go against Apocalypse as well, and he's classified as an Omega level mutant, the most powerful psionic in any reality. Not just that one, and he's near omnipotent. So he's basically a living god. Neat. Just a fraction of power was enough to overload Omega and Mimic in Dark X-Men issue 2. Sentry and Nate Gray both fought Galactus in Dark X-Men issue 3, so it's fair to throw him on this list, I'd say. Number 3, Selene. AKA Black Priestess, Selene made her first debut in New Mutants issue 9. She was born 17,000 years ago, give or take, right after the oceans, you know, ate Atlantis. She was an enemy of the sorcerer Kulon Gath in Uncanny X-Men 191, and her powers are pretty spectacular, and also terrifying. She she can drain the life force out of you in order to live longer. All she has to do is come into physical contact and you're toast, mister. No fist bumping Selene in this house. Her tribe realized she was powerful right from the get go, way back when humankind was just starting to evolve, really. So her tribe's elders all sacrificed their lives to make her more powerful and everlasting. That's a solid tribe, ride or die right there. They obviously chose die, but still, they're riding a little bit. The character Selene from the Underworld series, funny enough, was actually based off of this Selene from the comics. And I can totally see Kate Beckinsale now every time I see her. And so will you. Number two, Apocalypse. Making his first steps in Marvel graphic novel issue 17, he was born nearly 5,000 years ago at the edge of the Valley of the Kings in ancient Egypt. He was born with gray skin and had blue lines all over his face. He looked different, so he was abandoned by his tribe. He was raised with the nomads with the idea that only the strong survive. So Apocalypse was killed by agents of Ozymandias, but was later revived thanks to his mutant abilities. Where to even begin with this Omega level mutant's abilities? I mean, self molecular manipulation allows for him to alter his physical form for starters. He's also a genius. Even before being modified by the celestial ship, Apocalypse was already living for thousands of years. All he has to do is drift into a gentle coma. Number one trick to getting your beauty sleep. A coma, that ought to do it. X-Men Age of Apocalypse from 1995, we see just how big and bad this guy can can get. Oscar Isaac also had a swing at him in X-Men Apocalypse on the big screen, and I thought he was pretty scary, but when he gets big, it's just nightmare fuel. Check it out. And finally, number one, Onslaught. Making his first debut in X-Men issue 15, Onslaught was a sentient psionic entity created by the minds of Charles Xavier and Magneto. What a combo. So when the X-Men were fighting the Acolytes, Wolverine hit Magneto, and then in turn, Magneto ripped the adamantium from Wolverine's bones, which I gotta say, I thought hangnails were bad. This sounds way worse. His healing factor had to work overtime, and Xavier was beyond upset, so he shut down Magneto's mind. He just made him completely catatonic. But during this moment, all of Magneto's lust for hate and violence leaked into Charles' consciousness, creating this new personality, Onslaught. Onslaught is pretty OP. He has the ability to tap into the psychic resources of the astral plane, where he can then manipulate matter and energy. Telepathy, telekinesis, electromagnetic manipulation, just a combo you don't want to face in any way. Number 10, Karma. Karma is a mutant with very specific powers, so it should surprise no one that she is part of the New Mutants team. I actually love the New Mutants for this reason. A lot of their members tend to be forgotten and yet are super powerful when their abilities are properly utilized. Xi'an Koiman possesses limited telepathic abilities, but can have a strong sense of sort of psychic projection. Karma can emit a wave of energy that disables her target's consciousness, allowing her to take over control of their body. Body, experiencing what they experience as though she were actually in their body, sensing what they taste, hear, smell, see, and feel. Those she controls will awaken unaware, afterwards experiencing this possession as if they had just been in a dream and basically had been sleepwalking. She can also do this on a mass scale, possessing multiple people, though she must overcome many challenges in order to fluidly control multiple people at once. Number 9, Hijack. Hijack is David Bond, a technopath mutant who can use his abilities to telepathically control any vehicle. He has used his powers to control massive sentinels and even control an entire helicarrier. The rule seems to be if you can steer it, fly it, or drive it, Hijack can control it. Although it has been implied that the vehicle in question likely needs to have some kind of mechanical makeup. So, sailboats are probably not something Bond could manipulate. Unless you had a sailboat that also had an engine, which 
I think is a thing now. <laughs> I don't think all sailboats are just sails. Still, in a world where we are surrounded by tech and tons of engine powered vehicles, David Bond's abilities are pretty powerful. Alas, he has only appeared in less than 50 issues of comics. Someone tell me, where is David Bond now? Where is he on Krakoa? Is he there? I want to see him. Number 8. Summoner Summoner is a new mutant whose name also signifies the type of mutant that they are. They are the child of Apocalypse's first horsemen of war. Arako, the landmass itself, was drawn to Krakoa and Krakoa to it. The two fused together to increase the size of the land overall, although Arako is not yet considered safe and is basically known as kind of the monster territory part of Krakoa. I mean, technically it still isn't Krakoa, but they're attached now, so they are each other. Summoner's abilities allow them to summon the dark beasts of of Arako. We don't know too much about them yet because they've only been in a few issues, but what we do know is that they can withstand the blast of one of Cable's thermal grenades, his last one in fact, without taking virtually any damage. So overall, they seem like they're going to be pretty crazy and powerful. X of Swords, I'm assuming we're going to see more about them. Number 7. Dust. Dust is Soraya Kadir. She was enslaved as a child but freed by the X-Men. Originally, she did not want to reveal herself to the mutants and hid herself by turning into scattered sand. When Jean Grey sensed her presence and encouraged Soraya to reveal and introduce herself, she did so by referring to herself as To Rob, which is Arabic for dust. She can turn herself into dust and manipulate her body to move at high speeds, causing her to become a deadly sandstorm to her enemies. As sand particles, she can also enter the bodies of other people, causing internal damage. Dust is also resistant to magic and telepathic manipulation or detection while in her sand form. Dust is another person that I feel like we never see enough of in the comics. Someone bring back Dust. Number 6. Layla Miller Layla's abilities, skills, and powers tend to be pretty specific, which means that she might not inherently seem powerful to readers. Layla has been shown to be able to reanimate beings, heal wounds, and appears to be immune to reality warping. She also has a lot of knowledge about her own future life and the events surrounding it as she spent time in the future and then returned and uploaded all she had learned into her younger self when she returned to that Layla's present, which I guess was technically her past. Her vast knowledge often comes in handy and is what helped the mutants to figure out who was really after the baby mutant Messiah during the events of Messiah Complex. Her own knowledge has also technically helped her in gaining the knowledge that she is needed to have in order to gain it, if that makes any sense. Timey wimey stuff. Number 5. Maxime and Manon Maxime and Manon are twin siblings born to mutant parents. Their powers as such manifested when they were younger than most. They haven't been in a ton of comics, most of it probably 11 issues, but they have been shown to be pretty deadly and powerful even as children, both in Extermination and recently in the newest run of New Mutants. Maxime can influence others emotions while Manon can alter someone's memories or recall their memories past. When combined, their powers actually allow them to manipulate the minds of other to the point that they can easily control them, shaping their victims into whatever they like them to be and making them do whatever they want. In issues 3 and 4 of New Mutants, both Maxime and Manon were captured along with Armor, Glob, Angel Salvador, Beak, and the couple's children, but managed to escape. Manon and Maxime helped to free the rest of the group by distracting their captives, manipulating one of them into killing the other. Number 4. Mirage You might not recognize her mutant name, but if you've seen the New Mutants film or you are familiar with the New Mutants at all, Mirage will be someone that you maybe know. Mirage is actually Daniel Moonstar. Standard X-Men fans may be less familiar with Danny, but she has also been one of the X-Men and she is known for her affiliation with the New Mutants crew and all the female defenders who are also known as Valkyroar. Danny herself became a Valkyrie when the New Mutants were kidnapped by Amora the Enchantress and taken to Asgard. So she doesn't just have her mutant power of illusion creation and telepathy, which originally she could only use to recreate the fear of others, but she also has some of the powers granted to Valkyries. Oh, and she can make cool psionic arrows too. Number 3. Strong Guy Strong Guy has similar powers to another mutant we talked about on part 1 of this list. His abilities allow him to use kinetic energy to augment his strength, increasing it. However, he cannot hold the energy for long as it could severely harm him, distort his physical form, or even kill him. Still, even with the rule that he must expel any absorbed energy within less than 2 minutes of absorption, he is pretty powerful, using his powers to safely lift up to around 100 tons. Strong Guy's real name is Guido Carosella, and he first appeared in the original New Mutant series in issue 29. 
Number 2 A Mutant With No Name In the alternate reality belonging to the ultimate universe of 1610, we got a story that introduced us to a mutant who had no name. This mutant's powers were so devastating that we were not permitted the time to get to know him. His powers had only just manifested, but they were so deadly that they caused the deaths of over 200 people in his hometown including his parents and his girlfriend at high school, with the deaths being almost instantaneous. But there was no snapping involved, it wasn't a Thanos thing, no infinity gone. His mutant power was basically to kill everything around him, radiating toxins and poisons that basically vaporize organic tissue. He was so dangerous, powerful, and deadly that Wolverine was sent to eliminate him as the young mutant's existence posed too much of a threat to the mutant image, as well as both humans and mutants alike, just in general. Number 1 Matthew Malloy Matthew Malloy is one of the strongest, most random mutants who now belongs to the alternate timeline of Earth 14923 because he was just too powerful to basically continue to exist. Like many of the most epic mutants, he had reality warping powers and was additionally considered omega level in terms of his ability. Matthew's powers unfortunately were often tied to his emotions, which proved problematic and often resulted in massively destructive outbursts of energy. In the end, Tempest traveled back in time and with help from Professor X of the past, was able to prevent Matthew's parents from ever meeting, meaning that he was never born. 